Hello and welcome to Nous, the podcast where we tackle the deepest questions about the mind. I'm your host, Ilan Goodman, and for this episode, I spoke to one of the pioneers of a radical new theory of depression. Now, for regular listeners of the podcast, you'll find uh, it's a very different perspective on mental illness than the one offered by Lucy Johnston, who is a guest I interviewed in a previous episode. And that's an episode that has proved quite popular. I've had a number of emails and messages about it um, from people who were either provoked in some cases or persuaded by her ideas. I, for one, hope that there is something to this theory that we explore in this episode. Um, After all, psychiatry is at a crisis point, so it really needs some good news. Uh, Pharmaceutical companies, after decades of failure, have pretty much given up trying to develop new antidepressants and, and indeed new psychiatric drugs in general. While at the same time, the number of people suffering from depression is growing pretty rapidly every year. So... Might this new approach offer some hope? Well, have a listen and see what you think. So my guest today is the head of the psychiatry department at the University of Cambridge, no less. And he joins me this very early winter morning to talk about his recent best-selling book, The Inflamed Mind. Professor Edward Bulmore, welcome to Naus. Good morning. So let's get stuck in straight away. The theory you're proposing can be stated fairly simply, right? So uh, in outline, what, what is the claim that you argue for in the book? The claim is quite a simple one, as you say. It, it, if you strip it right down to its basics, the claim is that the body and the mind are connected. Particularly, they're connected by the immune system. And there's an awful lot of evidence that inflammation and depression go together. You know, there's, I, I would say that's beyond reasonable doubt, actually. I would say we've all had experiences of being inflamed and not feeling so great. Maybe it doesn't amount to clinical depression, but I think we've all had that experience of how inflammation can change your levels of energy, can change the way you feel about the future. Um, and when you look, uh, as people have done in research studies, if you, if you find people with true depression, and measure uh, proteins in the blood or cells in the blood that are representative of the uh, inflammatory state of the immune system is very consistently evidence for increased levels of inflammation in people with depression. So the association between those two things, whether it's by common knowledge or by those kind of case control um, experiments that people have done over the last 10, 15 years, it all stacks up, uh, I think, quite consistently, that inflammation and depression go together. The The big question is about the nature of that relationship. Is it causal? Does inflammation cause depression? And if so, what are the implications in terms of treatment? Um, and that's really the subject of the book. And, you, and spoiler alert, you are saying it's probably causal, or in many cases, it is a causal relationship, right? That's That's what you're arguing for? I would say the balance of evidence favours causality. Okay. Yeah. So I, I wanted to ask about, in a sense, why you wanted to write this book for a wide audience, for a popular audience. So you, you do say in the book, you know, the science isn't settled yet on this topic. And there's, there's depression is something that there's, you know, there's a lot of public interest in because a lot of people have experienced it. So they have a personal sort of skin in the game, if you like. Um, so why was it so important to write this for a general audience before you, before the science is settled, before there are any clear treatments, for example? What was driving you there? Well, I think, you know, first of all, when you write a book like this, you're, you are writing for, well, I was writing for a general audience, but you also know that uh, with luck, you're going to be read by c- colleagues, by others in the field. So you're always, in a sense, writing at two levels. Um, and I thought it was important to take a step back a little uh, from the, the detail of the field and just look a, look a bit about the relationship between inflammation and depression. Why is the idea that inflammation might cause depression 
for some people, quite a sort of challenging, uh, surprising, disruptive idea. And when you scratch the surface a little bit, it, I think it comes down to the way that we tend to think about the relationship between body and mind, particularly in Western medicine. And in the book, I go on to, you know, I hope not too long a riff, but I do riff a bit on Descartes and Cartesianism and this dualist idea of a sort of hard line, if you will, between body and mind, the idea that those two things are completely different and couldn't possibly have a causal uh, relationship between them directly. And I think that is the sort of premise for a lot of thinking in medicine still. And it's not a really a sort of, it's not purely a scientific issue. Uh, it sort of edges into philosophy, it edges into the sort of fundamental ways we think about how healthcare is organized, how doctors are trained. Um, and for those reasons, I thought it was worth exploring in a more general way. And you do frame the whole book as, uh, and the whole approach as sort of overcoming the Cartesian divide. And where, where I felt that really paid off was when you were talking about the kind of organizational repercussions of that Cartesian divide. So I was struck by your description of uh, the NHS in 2020 as still being planned on Cartesian lines. So you say that uh, patients literally go through different doors, attend different hospitals to consult differently trained doctors about their dualistically divided bodies and minds. Um, and later on, you also use the phrase uh, medical apartheid mm. to describe the same thing. So I, I was I was just, I guess I was particularly struck by the idea that this is kind of baked in to the way the whole system is organized. Mm. How does that get in the way of making the kind of progress that you want to make? Well, I think, you know, everything's fine with that split, except for the fact that, you know, a lot of people have an illness experience which includes both physical and psychological symptoms at the same time. You know, there are a lot of people whose, uh, if you will, principal diagnosis is a psychiatric disorder like schizophrenia or depression, but nevertheless, they have quite significant physical health problems. And then you've got people whose main diagnosis would be a, a physical illness. I talk a lot about arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, psoriasis. You know, there are a lot of inflammatory diseases uh, which are associated with increased risks of depression and anxiety. So actually, you know, there are a lot of patients, there are a lot of people seeking treatment for both uh, bodily and mental symptoms. And I think it is, you know, very often to their disadvantage that services aren't set up the same way. Services are set up as if everybody comes to the doctor very, very cleanly with either a mental problem and no bodily issues whatsoever or vice versa. Um, I called it medical apartheid sort of thoughtfully, I think. I, I did give that phrase quite a bit of thought. I didn't want to use the word apartheid uh, loosely or disrespectfully. Um, but I think it is a split in the same way that apartheid was, a segregation. And although I don't think uh, the system has been designed to do harm in the way that perhaps racial apartheid in South Africa might have been, I think it is not always to the advantage of patients um, that things are as they are. I mean, you, 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 tell, you tell some sort of personal stories, experiences, anecdotes of... Uh, of, of dealing with this yourself. Uh, I mean, you, the, is it Mrs. P, the one example? And then also the, the other one, just while, while I've got it fresh in my head, is uh, a sort of a, a sort of aside that a psychiatrist made to you that, you know, if, if you want to be a psychiatrist, you need to sort of stop worrying about the physical symptoms. Let's just talk about those two stories and how they sort of exemplify this, this separation. Well, Mrs. P, she was a, a woman... Um, probably in her late 40s, early 50s, with arthritis. Uh, I saw her when I was a young doctor. I was a physician in training. Um, so this was before I specialized in psychiatry. Uh, and I saw her in a medical outpatient clinic. And she came in and talked to me about her joint pain and her other physical symptoms uh, of arthritis. And, and then I noticed she wasn't looking uh, very cheerful. And I started asking her questions about her mental state. How was she feeling? Uh, and she very fluently, quietly 
uh, trotted through a list of depressive symptoms. It was clear that she was depressed. Um, and I went back to the consultant physician who was, you know, in charge of the case. And I said, look, I think I made this, you know, quote unquote discovery. Mrs. P is not only got arthritis, she's also depressed. Uh, and the consultant sort of looked up, looked at me and said, well, you would be, wouldn't you? And then we changed the subject and talked about something else. And I, that memory has stuck with me. And that was about 30 years ago, 20, 30 years ago. Because that simple phrase, well, you would be, wouldn't you, actually carries quite a lot of um, freight when you think about it carefully. And what he was saying, I think, is, yes, she's depressed, but it's nothing really to do with her arthritis. It's to do with the way she's thinking about her arthritis. You know, she knows she's got this uh, long-term progressive uh, disorder. Uh, it's attacking her joints. It could degrade her mobility. Maybe she's thinking in a year or two she'll she'll be wheelchair bound, and that's why she's depressed. It's not a direct manifestation of the autoimmune uh, problem that is causing her joint disease in her body. It's a reflection. It's a conscious reflection on her physical state rather than directly linked to her physical state. And I think it's quite a good example, that little vignette, I think is quite a good example of how some quite fundamental philosophical ideas actually can get embedded in practice and can become sort of catchphrases almost that people bring out without necessarily thinking too deeply about what they're really saying and what they really mean. But that phrase, you would be, would you, wouldn't you, is very much in keeping with what we've already discussed, this split between body and mind. If somebody's got both mental and physical symptoms, the orthodoxy is that can't be explained by a direct mechanistic relationship between them. There must be a problem in the body machine, as Descartes might have said, and then the disembodied mind is reflecting on that and thinking gloomily about the future. Yeah, there's a lot in that, isn't there? And it, it's it's bringing to mind, so it's, listeners might be familiar with an early episode of the podcast where I, I interviewed the clinical psychologist Lucy Johnston. Um, now, Lu Lucy is a, a vociferous critic of the you know, the biomedical approach to mental and emotional distress, as she would call it. She wouldn't want to call it mental illness because that already medicalizes it. Um, now, we haven't got into the nitty gritty yet, but but your theory that, you know, inflammation can cause depression mm. might might seem to be coming from the other end of the spectrum. It might seem to be coming from the idea that, you know, depression is caused by things going on in the brain and the biology. But... Uh, if this isn't too big a question, where would you place yourself in terms of, uh, you know, sort of approaching psychiatric problems from the more biomedical angle mm -hmm. versus from the more psychosocial? Right. Um, or, or is that a false dichotomy? Well, I don't know that it's a false dichotomy because it is the reality of the field. But I would say it's another reflection. It's another manifestation of this same dualist thinking that we've already been talking about. Um, you know, psychiatry, mental health is itself split to some extent between these two wings, the biomedical wing, the physical wing on the one hand, the sort of psychological edging into social and spiritual wing on the other side. You know, we are, uh, we manifest uh, dualism in our internal organization within mental health, uh, I think. Now, one of the things I like about this theory I see it as neither exclusively on the biomedical side or the psychosocial side. And the hinge that joins those two, and I think this is absolutely fascinating in an area where the field is going to move quite fast, is thinking about stress and what stress does to the immune system. Because social stress, you know, bereavement, uh, any kind of, you know, setback in the, in the real world, we know is uh, a risk factor for depression. That's a very robust finding. Uh, people will have experienced that, I'm sure, uh, to some extent themselves. And you can see it epidemiologically. Stress uh, predicts depression. What we haven't um, so far, I don't think, completely unraveled is how stress causes depression. Uh, 
And I think it's in that context very interesting to note that stress causes inflammation. Um, uh, and those could be major life stresses like bereavement, or they could be quite trivial, acute stresses like a bit of public speaking. And there's a very nice experiment that I talk about in the book where people, healthy teachers, were asked to do a bit of public speaking and, and blood tests were carried out before and after. Uh, and it was clear that there was a blip uh, in their um, immune response uh, as a result of that simple stress. And I find that very interesting in its own right, but also in relation to the point you're making. What, where does this theory sit in terms of the, if you will, fragmentation of mental health science generally? And I think one of the attractive things about it is that it is potentially a bridging theory. It helps us understand how things that go on in the social world um, can have impacts on our physical state, which in turn could cause changes in our mental state. And I think it's very important that we look for theories and look for ideas in mental health that are integrative uh, and try and pull things together rather than, you know, me stridently saying, you know, I've come to the conclusion it's all, you know, one system in the body or it's all one cell or molecule. Or somebody else, on the other hand, saying uh, people who think about depression biomedically are mindless, um, they're not engaged with you know, the, the psychological issues properly. Um, you know, that, that sort of slightly confrontational dialogue in mental health has not been to our advantage as a community. And I think we'll do better if we can try and think about, uh, you know, where mental health symptoms come from in a more integrative way. And I think that's where the sort of links between stress, inflammation, depression, you know, is a, is a sketch, is a prototype for the kind of theory that I think can bring things together in that way. Because one of the contentions would be that, you know, very often depression, for example, is a meaningful response to experiences, to trauma, to stress. As, as you say, it, it's, stress is a sort of um, term that, that I, f I feel that the more biologically oriented people like because there are clear sort of biomedical markers connect, associated with stress or labeled as stress responses, aren't there? Whereas it's also a word that shifts nicely into everyday vernacular of mm. suffering or distress or dealing with difficult Indeed. stuff, whatever it might be. So it's sort of, it does that bridging work, as you say, yeah. kind of nicely. But the idea is that um, you can be having meaningful responses to experiences, difficult experiences in your life, and that might have immune corollaries, I guess. Yeah. And, and so it's, it's connecting these two domains across, yeah. this, across this divide. Alain, one thing I think I should say just before we go too much further is um, another thing that I've tried to, another um, sacred cow, if you will, I've tried to deal with in the book is this idea that there's going to be one theory for depression. You know that that everybody who's depressed is this is depressed for the same reason, um, and that somebody and it might be a psychologist or it might be a physiologist or it might be a, a psychiatrist. Somebody is going to find that single root cause, and I think that's really been a problem for the whole field as well. Uh, certainly, in terms of you know antidepressant drug development, uh, I think it's it's been quite unhelpful to imagine that everybody who's depressed is depressed for the same reason and therefore there should be somewhere out there a, another blockbuster, a panacea, which is going to make everybody happy. You know, I just don't think it's like that. I think it's much more likely that depression, which after all is a very, very loosely defined syndrome, I, I've um, actually, I could have multiple causes. Dropped in the, uh, I quickly looked up the DSM criteria for depression. <laughs> um and they, I mean, they cover a lot of things. So um, if, if anyone, so I, f for those who are familiar with the, the DSM, it stands for the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and it tends to get called the, the uh, Psychiatrist Bible. And it lists all of the possible things you can be diagnosed with. And um, major depressive disorder, um, in order to meet the criteria for major depressive disorder, uh, you have to be. You have to experience five or more symptoms from a list of eight possible symptoms for at least two weeks. <laughs> um, they they have to include 
one of the first two. So you see, it's, it gets very complex and it gets that there's, there's so many different combinations, aren't there, of symptoms, some of them kind of opposite. So it yes. could be, uh, it could be weight gain or weight loss, That's right. for example. <laughs> um, it, it, so many different configurations of symptoms can be labeled with this one diagnosis. Which gets at this idea that maybe it's not one thing, really. It's, it's, it's a serious problem that a lot of people have with the DSM. Um, so that maybe, as you, as you refer to it in the book, inflamed depression is one kind of depression. Or maybe there's even multiple kinds of that. Is, is yes. that sort of what you're saying? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, just before we leave DSM, you're absolutely right to highlight the, the sort of non-specificity of some of those symptoms. I mean, you know, weight going up, weight going down, sleeping too much, sleeping too little. Those are all symptoms of depression, according to DSM. Um, the other thing that's striking about that uh, diagnostic formulation, I don't know if you got to this, but right at the bottom of that list, it says, oh, by the way, if there's any associated medical abnormality or physio physiological disturbance that could account for the symptoms, it's not major depressive disorder. And I would point to that as another example of this dualist fault line that runs through the whole of medicine, the whole of psychiatry, the whole of mental health science, this sort of compulsion we seem to have to split things into purely mental and purely physical, and it's there in, in DSM. But I think the reality is much more likely to be the case that, you know, depression, uh, we can think of as a syndrome, quite a common syndrome, you know, it's about 5% point prevalence. Um, one in four risk lifetime for each of us to have a depressive episode. You know, it's a very, very common thing. It's a really astonishing figure that which it you is. quote in your book. And I, who who produces that figure? I it's so it's shocking. I mean, well, I think it is shocking when you. I mean, I, I think the numbers about mental health on you know on a public health scale on an epidemiological scale are so enormous. It's quite difficult to you know really sort of intuit what that means at a personal level. I often say. You know, with that kind of lifetime risk, 25% risk of depression, you know, it's uh, roughly equivalent to the idea that every family on the planet will be touched by depression. Um, it might not be you or me personally, but somebody in our family, a child, a parent, a grandparent, will have uh, experience of uh, a major depressive illness. It's it's that common. Um and I, you know, I think that's a, I think that's a very useful thing to keep saying, you know, because I think one of the, you, you know, the again historical things that we've inherited about mental illness is the idea that it's rather an alien experience. It's rather a sort of extreme or abnormal uh, state to be in. That people who are mentally ill are quite distinctly different from the rest of us who are all perfectly normal. And I think the epidemiology reminds us that this actually is very common. Um, now, if you think about where the rest of medicine has gone. Uh, historically, people have often, you know, we've often started with quite a big syndromal diagnosis like depression. And I would point to fever as an, you know, as an example. And you go back 150 years, you went to your doctor because you were feeling hot and sweaty, um, shivery. The doctor would have taken the temperature and said, the diagnosis is fever, and I'm going to treat that with diet or exercise or bed rest or whatever it might have been at the time. The big breakthrough came when people realized that fever wasn't one thing, that you could have fever for many different reasons, many different infections, uh, many different species of bacteria, ultimately, or virus. And each of those causes has a particular treatment. And we've done much, much, much better by disaggregating fever clinically, diagnosing the cause, and then treating the cause. And I think with depression, and quite probably many other psychiatric diagnoses, we're still at that syndromal phase. We're still thinking about this as a sort of checklist of symptoms. And I think the progress will come as we realize that actually there are many ways that you can be depressed in the same way that there are many ways you can have fever. And the breakthroughs in treatment are going to be focused on causes. So new treatments for inflamed depression you know, to say this another way, I do not think are going to be for everybody. I think they might be for a percentage of people with depression. Um, and that percentage, you know, is going to be defined by diagnostic tests, by looking a little bit more deeply into the uh, the body, 
the immune system specifically when people come forward with symptoms of depression, trying to figure out in this particular case, could inflammation play a part? And if so, maybe we ought to be thinking about some anti-inflammatory approach. Okay, we, we, we better get on to uh, talking through some of the evidence for this connection and for a causal connection. I mean, what what would you say are the sort of the main areas that are suggesting that this is this this is a an avenue that needs to be explored much more thoroughly? Well, you know, first of all, there's an awful lot of evidence from animal experiments that if you make animals inflamed, um, and of course, of course, you can do that in animals under very carefully controlled circumstances, you very predictably, very replicably induce behavioural changes in those animals, which look like depression in some ways. You induce changes in behavior, social behavior, ability. Um, and although we can't ask an animal, are you you know, experiencing as much pleasure as normal, you can do various experiments, for example, offering animals a choice between a sweetened liquid, which they would usually prefer, and a, pla and a plain water. Um, and one of the things that happens following inflammation in animals is that they switch from their usual presumably pleasure-seeking preference for sweetened water and, and start drinking more of the plain water. So there's an awful lot of evidence from animals uh, to show that inflammation can cause changes in the brain, can cause changes in behavior that look like depression. If we say, well, okay, well, that's, that's as may be, but you know, depression is a human condition, which we're never going to very precisely capture with animal models. What's the evidence in humans? Um, I'd point to two kinds of evidence uh, in particular. I think there's the uh, longitudinal uh, studies that have been done, and we touched on this a moment uh, uh, earlier. Um, you know, if inflammation caused depression, you would expect to see cases where inflammation precedes depression. And people have shown that uh, in longitudinal studies. There's some work that colleagues of mine here in Cambridge, Peter Jones and Golam Kandakar, have done looking at uh, longitudinal data collected over many years. And, and it turns out that kids at the age of eight or nine who have slightly increased levels of inflammatory protein in their blood at that age are at increased risk of depression nine or ten years later. Um, uh, and we have seen similar kind of longitudinal effects in other data sets. So that's one thing I'd point to. Can, can we just jump in and, and clarify what, you, what kind you're talking about as inflammation uh, here? Um, so we're, we're familiar with getting a bruise or a cut or, you know, um, that kind of inflammation, I guess. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> just, just elaborate a little bit on what you're talking about, what kind of biomarkers you're right. using. Okay. So you're right. I have been using the word inflammation very generally. Um, you said we're all familiar with a bruise or cut. And you know, let's just start there. You know, if you injure your hand, let's say, um, a day or two later, you'll notice that the injury is looking red, it's looking swollen, it's tender. Um, and those are the classical clinical signs of inflammation, redness, swelling, tenderness. We've known that since the Romans, at least. But I think what is important for people that may not be familiar with the immune system is to know that that is always the tip of an iceberg. You know, you can what you can see uh, in terms of local inflammation is uh, typically indicative of a sort of systemic response. You know, when it, it's called the immune system for a reason. When your hand is injured and possibly infected, it's the whole immune system that responds, and that might be most visible locally. But you can detect it, for example, in a blood test. You can measure the levels of inflammatory proteins like cytokines. You can measure the uh, numbers of immune cells. The white blood cells may change in response to infection or inflammation. So it's important to be aware that you know it's a systemic response that we have um, when we get inflamed, and we can measure that. So I, yeah, so I picked up from your book. I mean, you you um, you explain this very accessibly because I didn't really know very much about the immune system at all, um, but you. You divide it into the, the the sort of the key players, or two of the key players at least in in this inflammatory system of the the macrophages, which are these bacteria and virus eating immune cells. That they also produce these 
cytokines. Is that how you pronounce it? Cytokines. So the cytokines seem to be the sort of chemical messengers that cause inflammation, or are do they sort of constitute the inflammation? Uh, yeah, I think of cytokines as kind of like inflammatory hormones. Yeah, they sort okay. of they they can circulate throughout the body in the blood, and they uh, you know usually coordinate an inflammatory response. Um, so the one of the ways in which the immune system works together as a system. So going back to this example of you've injured your hand, there will be an immediate immune response to that injury from the cells that you have sitting in your hand waiting for the body to be attacked in some way. Uh, and that includes the macrophages. They'll be sitting there waiting for something to happen, as it were. You have an injury they will immediately respond locally, but they'll also send out these cytokines into the bloodstream, and that will coordinate a more systemic response. So other macrophages may find their way to your hand, may pile in and, and try to reinforce the defense against infection. So are there ways you can be inflamed or be having an inflammatory response that don't correspond to some obvious like wound or injury i mean so 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 th but this this connects with ways in which depression might not might not be obviously connected to an illness right, or an correct. injury right? yes indeed yeah so i think it's a corollary of what I've, you know what we've been talking about is that inflammation isn't always uh clinically obvious um and certainly as we've become you know more sophisticated in measuring the immune system and and you know i think one of the drivers for all of this is the astonishing growth in immunology over the last 20 30 years i mean we really understand the system uh, you know in detail and uh, at scale in a way that we never did before um as we see more of it as we understand more of it uh it's uh, becoming increasingly clear that you know uh, there are a proportion of people who would not know they're inflamed but if you do a blood test, it turns out that the proteins are up a bit, the cell counts are up a bit. It's low-grade inflammation. It's not on the same scale as you would see in a patient, you know, uh, battling a major infection or with a, a major autoimmune disease. But nevertheless, um, this kind of low-grade inflammation is, is, you know, quite common. Um, and uh, I suspect that as we become ever more sophisticated in the immune system, we may realize it's commoner even than we think it is at the moment. Um, and it's that, you know, clinically invisible inflammation uh, that uh, has been associated with major depressive disorder. Mm, fascinating. Okay, so, so we've talked about evidence from animal studies, yeah. longitudinal evidence that shows there's an association between increased levels of inflammation and later emergence of right. depression. Um, one, one of the um, uh, elements of this story, and it, in, you, you talked about the development in our understanding of the immune system, mm. was that for, for a very long time, people thought the brain wasn't affected mm. by the immune system, didn't they? Mm. And, and that's one of the things you talk about, the, the Berlin Wall in the brain. Yeah. Um, what, what's changed with our understanding there? Yeah, well, yeah, you know, that's a very good point. And I, you know, I certainly remember and I make the point in my book that, you know, when I was a medical student, which was, uh, I guess, around the mid 80s, you know, we were taught as a matter of fact that the immune system had nothing to do with the brain. The jargon phrase was the brain is immune privileged. Um, and what that meant was that the brain sat the other side of the so-called blood brain barrier and the blood-brain barrier was conceived a little bit like the Berlin Wall at the time, an absolutely impermeable barrier. So nothing in the blood, none of these proteins and cells, these invisible markers of inflammation that we've been talking about, none of that could get into the brain, we were taught, unless there was some kind of catastrophe that disrupted the blood-brain barrier. If there was some kind of tumor or stroke or some major damage, uh, then, okay, the immune system might get access to the brain, but under normal circumstances, the brain was immune privileged. Now, what's changed is uh, we, when I say we, I mean, the world has discovered that there are in fact many ways uh, in which immune or inflammatory signals in the body can get across that barrier into the brain, even when, uh, you know, the brain appears to be basically healthy. Um, one example, 
which I think is quite interesting, is the vagus nerve. You know, the vagus nerve is obviously part of the nervous system, um, but it turns out to be sensitive to the amount of inflammatory protein in the body. Um, so if you get inflamed in your body, the vagus nerve is going to pick that up and it's going to send a signal into the brain to say the body's inflamed. And actually there's some interesting evidence that that might trigger a reflex response. The vagus puts out another uh, loop of, of nerves to try and damp down the inflammation it's detected in the body. That's homeostasis, the vagus nerve trying to keep things the same in the body. So it has a sort of it can have a sort of calming effect on yeah. the inflammation system. Yeah. I, I did find myself rubbing my oracles. Yes, good. <laughs> uh, as I read your book. <laughs> so um th this <laughs> this was a story that so the oracle spelled A U uh are the sort of bits your ears basically, right? Yes. <laughs> and, it's the little sort uh, of knob of cartilage just okay. above your you know, where the ear canal is. Yeah. It's just inside the ear. Okay, yeah. okay. And that connects with the vagus nerve is the vagus right? nerve provides the sensation to that patch of skin mm. so it, when you when you rub your oracle you are directly stimulating your vagus and and it was sort of at some point um what were the examples you used people overeating cats yes <laughs> well we were taught about, again again you know it's it's the book was an excuse for me to sort of indulge in a lot of wandering down memory lane about the way we were taught medicine uh, all those years ago we were taught about it uh, in terms of something called the alderman's itch. <laughs> and, the, uh, <laughs> and the idea was that if you were an alderman in the city of London and you were attending a great banquet and you know suffering indigestion, um, rubbing your oracles uh, was a discreet, <laughs> a, a discreet way of trying to calm down your gastrointestinal system. Um, and of course, people didn't know at the time, but that might be because you know, you're stimulating the vagus and the vagus innovates the gut as well as the immune system and the heart and pretty much every other organ in the body. Uh, and it's also bringing to mind another fascinating thing that I, I learned from your book um, that I'd never come across before, which is that um, stimulating the vagus nerve with kind of vibrations is actually a licensed treatment for depression. Yes. Not with... So let's, to be clear, the licensed treatment is an electrical device, okay, yeah. which you have to implant. Electric. It's a little bit like a um, pacemaker. Uh, and the electrodes sit on the vagus nerve. As the vagus nerve runs down your neck from your brain to the body, you can plant the electrodes there and stimulate there. That's been licensed for depression for quite a long time in the States. Um, it's never been uh, entirely clear how it works. Um, I think a lot of people historically have thought that maybe when you stimulate the vagus, that electrical signal goes north. It goes back up the vagus into the brain. It does something in the brain to make you less depressed. But we do know that if you stimulate the vagus, it will have an anti-inflammatory effect in the body too. So that signal can go south. It can go into the body. It can uh, modify inflammation. And that could be uh, why it works as an antidepressant. I say could be, we don't know that, but uh, it's certainly an intriguing coincidence that the vagus is anti-inflammatory, vagal stimulation is a licensed antidepressant. Um, it would be consistent with the idea that inflammation can cause depression, um, but we need more studies. Now, it also gets co-opted, doesn't it, or it gets um, explained by reference to the serotonin theory, which listeners will probably be familiar with the kind of chemical imbalance idea mm. which has been popular for a long time or at least it, it's a very sort of almost intuitively easy idea to to latch on to mm. um is it time we just set that aside completely I mean, you, you're not complimentary about it in the book um the evidence just doesn't stack up for it anymore does it well again i think you have to be a little bit nuanced here because you know, a lot of the antidepressant drugs we have now are serotonin boosters of one sort or another, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs like Prozac. That's a mainstay of treatment. And they work. You know, if you look at the clinical trial data, they work better than placebo. And for some people, they work very well. So I don't want to, you know, trash 
uh, the efficacy of uh, serotonin boosting antidepressant drugs because I think that's quite clearly demonstrated by clinical trials. The area that I was trying to have a go at in the book is the explanatory theory. You know, okay, so the drugs work, but how do they work? And how do we know that they're going to work in any particular patient? And, you know, one of the stories I tell in the book is, you know, when I was starting in psychiatry, um, you know, I'd probably been doing psychiatry just a year or two, seeing a patient who came to the outpatient clinic told me he was depressed and wanted to know what I was going to do about it. And this was about 1990, about the time of Prozac's launch. I was quite optimistic. I said to him, you know, we've got these fabulous new serotonin boosting drugs. We'll try on one of those. I'm sure it'll make a difference. And he said, you know, well, how do you know that's going to work? And I began to tell him this theory of the transmitter imbalance. And he said, no, how do you know that's going to, how do you know that's true for me? How do you know I've got a neurotransmitter imbalance in my brain that these drugs are going to fix? And that was a very penetrating question. And it's still a very penetrating question. You know, 30 years later, we still don't have any way of knowing what the status of serotonin metabolism is in any individual's brain. Um, so we prescribe these drugs. We explain that prescription to patients very often in terms of a transmitter imbalance, but it's something that we've never seen. We've never measured. Because in, you, in can't, you can't measure sort of serotonin levels in someone's brain. It just, it, it's just too difficult. Is that... Well, in, in the living brain, yeah. it's very difficult. There are, <laughs> you know, you, you, I mean, it's always very difficult to measure anything in the living brain, actually. But I mean, there are, you know, you can try and get at it. You can take a bit of cerebrospinal fluid. You could do a lumbar puncture. Or you could do certain sort of specialist types of brain scanning that may be more sensitive to serotonin specifically. But, you know, none of this is in clinical practice. And if you look at it in the clinical research studies, the results have been fairly inconsistent. You know, I would say it's worth just bearing in mind with the drugs, the the, the whole, you know, uh, list of uh, antidepressant drugs we have available for use at the moment. That's a sort of family of drugs that was invented by accident. You know, I mean, nobody started, people, we didn't start with clear evidence that serotonin imbalance caused depression and then find a drug that treated serotonin imbalance. We started the other way around. We accidentally discovered that drugs that boosted serotonin, adrenaline, noradrenaline, you know, that class of neurotransmitters were discovered quite accidentally to be mood lifting, mood boosting. And people got very excited about it. And then the theory, the explanation, was essentially reverse engineered to account for the clinical efficacy. So we did things, or, it, you know, historically, we discovered antidepressants exactly the wrong way around. You know, so the, it looked like the drugs sort of worked, so we developed a theory to explain why they might work. Yeah. But it turns out the theory doesn't have great evidence beyond that or when people have been trying to build the evidence base for it yes. um, the evidence isn't great in theory but also in practice it's completely just absent i mean there's no you know if you went to a doctor um he or she would not prescribe insulin let's say to lower your blood sugar until they'd measured blood glucose and and you knew that you had an imbalance of glucose in your body. Um, but we've got quite used to the idea that a psychiatrist um, may offer treatment that will rebalance serotonin without actually having measured serotonin. You know, it's, it's just a little bit too close to historical tradition, let's say, of treating depressive symptoms as if they were due to an excess of black bile or melancholia, you know, when Nobody ever measured black bile, and of course it's in, it's not measurable because it's not there. But it's it's one of those situations where you've got a sort of theory to justify a treatment which you can't verify. And and I, that that partly seems to underline the urgency of trying to find new targets, new explanations, new ways of understanding depression and other mental mm. illnesses, um, because psychiatry has been stuck for. Mm. decades really mm. hasn't it and it's been sort of stagnant in terms of developing effective new treatments in a way that just you know that, that contrasts so starkly with other areas of medicine 
Um, and it, it felt like that was also particularly important to you because you've worked, you worked for many years for uh, GlaxoSmithKline. Mm. And then they, they pulled funding in, was it 2010? Yeah. No, I mean, I think the, you know, the decision to exit uh, psychiatry in 2010 that GSK made um, as a business decision made a lot of sense. You know, the company had been putting a lot of money into R&D, trying to find new antidepressants for many years. Um, and the return on that investment was, well, virtually nil. Um, and that wasn't just true of GSK. It was true, is true, has been true of most major pharmaceutical companies were at one point or another pretty invested uh, and have failed to make much progress and have pulled out. Um, it's not all, you know, doom and gloom. I mean, you know, there is, for example, Janssen is one company that we continue to work with, that they, they have a strategic interest in mental health. And as you may know, they recently launched a version of ketamine uh, as a new form of antidepressant. And I think that is, you know, a very encouraging signal that actually if you're prepared to think carefully and think differently about uh, the causes of depression, it is possible to find still new treatments. You know, it's not that the field is dead forever, but certainly um, between the launch of Prozac in 1990 and, um, you know, the time that GSK exited psychiatry in 2010, that 20 year stretch, an awful lot of money was spent mm. by smart people trying to find antidepressant drugs and signally failing. Um, what what other uh, elements of the evidence and the kind of causal relationship have we missed so far that okay. we should? Well, I'm very, so I'm very interested in what we can do with, you know, in humans to get at this question of inflammation causing changes in the brain. And, um, you know, one of the ways that we can do that and is to give people, healthy people, an inflammatory shock, you know, which is not medically, you know, serious or dangerous, but for example, a typhoid vaccination. If you have a typhoid vaccination, it stimulates an immune response. And there are other ways in which you can give people an inflammatory shock in a safe experimental setting. And you can do that before uh, you can you can scan the brain of those uh, people, those participants, before and after the inflammatory shock. And you can see what difference you've made to the way that the brain works. And people have been doing this for several years now. And, you know, just last year, uh, somebody pulled together all the existing data in a meta-analysis and looked at the evidence overall and found there was quite uh, compelling evidence that inflammation causes changes in brain activity in particular brain areas, uh, many of which we've already implicated or have already been implicated in mood disorders and depression. And I think that's a very interesting piece of evidence. It speaks to causality. It shows that you can change the state of the immune system in the body, and that has a measurable effect on how the brain is working and how the brain is working in bits of the brain that we know are important for mood. Um, so I think that is one element that I would want to just draw to people's attention as well. That, you know, as we, as the field gets into this more seriously, we are beginning to link up neuroscience and immunology, use imaging to detect effects of inflammatory stimuli. And it appears that, you know, we can see the, the kind of effects that you'd want to be there if indeed inflammation caused depression. Mm. One element of the story we haven't touched on yet that seems really important is that there are a ton of anti-inflammatory yep. drugs yes, available. So if if your story is right, they should presumably, some of them should have some effect yes. on depression. Yes. Is that the case? Um, I would say there's a lot of circumstantial evidence for that. So, and what I mean by circumstantial is that, you know, there have been a lot of clinical trials done with anti-inflammatory drugs. Um where depression has been measured as a sort of secondary endpoint. It's not been the purpose of the trial, but a few simple questions will have been asked about mood or capacity for pleasure. And you can take those data and again, meta-analyze them, look at the pattern of results overall. Several people have done this. Uh, we published a paper about it last year, <laughs> and the effects have very consistently been um, confirmatory. 
uh, in that these anti-inflammatory treatments in trials for arthritis, psoriasis, inflammatory bowel disease have significant uh, mental health benefits in terms of these simple measures of mood that have, have been captured as secondary endpoints. And that's a lot of evidence, actually. And the trials on which that uh, conclusion is based are, for the most part, very well-designed, industry-standard, randomized uh, placebo-controlled trials. Um, the circumstantiality is that the trials were not designed for the purpose of proving that the anti-inflammatory drugs worked as antidepressants. And if you were to go back to the consultant physician I was talking about in relation to Mrs. P, if you go to, go back to somebody like that and say, look, we've got evidence that anti-inflammatory drugs have uh, mood benefits in people with arthritis, they'd say, well, you know, you would be, wouldn't you? You would, you would feel less depressed if you were in a clinical trial and somebody had given you a drug that made your joints less painful or improved mm, your long-term mm. outcome. So we need to do more trials that are specifically focused on the question, does this particular anti-inflammatory drug have a, an antidepressant uh, benefit in people where possible physical effects of the drug are not going to be a confounding factor? And since the book has been published, you've started working on your own trial, I believe it yes. started in September yeah. 2019. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, well, we've just started this trial. Um, it is, um, it's looking at a new kind of anti-inflammatory drug that we think is going to be important in blocking the inflammatory response to stress in the brain. Uh, and we are trying that drug together with conventional uh, SSRIs, conventional antidepressants, we're looking for people who are depressed, who've been depressed for some time despite adequate treatment with SSRIs like Prozac. And we do a couple of blood tests before people get into the trial just to make sure that inflammation could be contributing to the situation. Uh, and then the trial uh, goes on and you either get your usual SSRI plus this new anti-inflammatory drug or you get your usual SSRI plus a placebo. Uh, and we will see at the end of that uh, whether adding an anti-inflammatory drug confers additional benefits, particularly in people who are depressed and have not already responded to f what we might call first-line treatment with SSRIs. And people have done those kind of trials before, not very many, but there is some evidence to suggest that that's a particularly you know, that that could work therapeutically, that focusing the anti-inflammatory intervention on those people who've been tried with the, you know, the obvious treatment have not responded well. Anti-inflammatory interventions could kind of give an additional boost that might get people feeling better. And and this is a randomized double blind trial, is it? So 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 some people will be will be getting a placebo and the SSRI. So so this is the kind of evidence you you need to build if you want to to demonstrate that there show evidence for this causal link in in the right way. Yeah, I mean you know it, <clears throat> uh, obviously anti inflammatory drugs uh, and. I, and, and I would say not just drugs, by the way, but anti-inflammatory interventions, of which there might be many, you know, vagal nerve stimulation we've talked about. A lot of people are interested in diet as an anti-inflammatory intervention. Um, uh, stress management, you know, if you uh, tune into the idea that stress can cause inflammation, you know, can you, can you deal with inflammation by, for example, yoga, tai chi, um, mindfulness. Um, there's a lot of interest in these ideas. And again, going back to the discussion we were having right at the beginning about the sort of split within mental health between the biomedical and the psychosocial, you know, I, I do think it's quite important to emphasize that, at least as the way I see things, the relationship between the brain, the immune system, and the mind opens up opportunities for treatment from all different angles. It's not, it doesn't have to be pharmacological, pharmaceutical. I mean, that's the particular sort of direction I'm coming from. But there'll be other people looking at this and thinking about this uh, who might be much more interested in, for example, the dietary uh, 
opportunities to manipulate inflammation and potentially have antidepressant benefits. Where do you hope we might be in 10 years with this kind of research direction? Okay, well, if I step back and I think, where, where do I hope we're going to be in 10 years? I hope, my deepest hope, is that we will have sort of reformed the relationship between mind and body in Western medicine and that there will be many, many more opportunities for people to consult healthcare practitioners who are trained and competent to deal with all of it, all at once, the mental and the physical. One of the things we're, you know, big things we're trying to do down at the Cambridge Biomedical Campus is build a new hospital and research institute for children and young people. And I think one of the very exciting aspects about that project is it is a joint venture between Addenbrooke's, which is the you know medical trust, and Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Foundation Trust, which is the mental health trust. So you've got two those two parts mm. of the NHS coming together to do a big capital development as partners. And the the vision is that children and young people uh, treated in that centre will be treated um, mentally and physically all at once yeah. and not segregated in the traditional way. Now, you know, I think if we can see some developments like that moving forward, um, not just in Cambridge, but worldwide, that would be very exciting. Brilliant. That's, I didn't know about that project. Mm. That is that is very exciting. Overcoming the Cartesian divide. Right. <laughs> there you <Exactly>. are. Exactly. <laughs> Professor Edward Bullmore, thank you for your time. It's been a great pleasure, Alan. Thank you for talking to me. Thank you.